Good afternoon, everybody. I'm William Farfan Rios, a postdoc of the Living Earth Collaborative. Thank you, everyone, for coming to watch our last summer seminar series, Adventures in Biodiversity Research. But before to introduce our great speaker, two announcements. First, our previous summer talks are available for viewing in the YouTube channel of the Living Earth Collaborative. One is about conservation veterinarian by Dr. Mary Spring White. The other one is about conservation of forest elephants and Galapagos tortoises by Dr. Steve Blake. And this is our last seminar of the summer, but the Living Earth Collaborative will still promote more seminars in the fall. So please stay tuned to those seminars. And please, uh, you can pause your questions in the YouTube chat uh, for Dr. Laurie's answer at the end of the talk. Today, I have the great honor to introduce Dr. Pete Laurie. But before to start the talk, I will provide a little background of his research, his life. So Dr. Laurie is a director of the Africa Madagascar program at the Missouri Botanical Garden here in St. Louis. He's also adjunct associate professor of biology in the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And he's a research associate at the Kew Botanical Garden. This may or may not surprise you, but Pete wanted to be a botanist since he was 15 years old. And he liked more plants than animals. And after taking a plant taxonomy class when he was in college, he decided to be a taxonomist, specifically plant taxonomist. He got a master's from the University of Illinois and a PhD from Washington University, where he worked with Dr. Peter Raven. Pete was working in Africa since the 1980s, and he has done a myriad of field explorations in the world's hottest hotspots or biodiversity hotspots, such as Madagascar, but also in the Andes. He has collected around 8,000 plant specimens from 28 different countries and discovered and named over 300 plant species, 304 to be more precise, and published more than 200 papers. He is specialized in the Arelasi family. And one example of his discoveries is, if you see the plant behind me, that's a new species that he's describing from the Andes. So before it was named Schaeffler, and now it's Isiodafi. Uh, Pete's contribution to build this Africa Madagascar program at the Missouri Botanical Garden was remarkable and viral, largely built with passion, hard work, and a dedicated team of 150 people. Today, he will share all this experience of botanical exploration in the biodiversity hotspots. So please welcome warmly to Dr. Pete Lauris. Thanks very much, William. Uh, and thanks to the Living Earth Collaborative and especially to Jonathan Losos for inviting me to speak in this Adventures in Biodiversity Research series. And thanks to all of you who've tuned in today or who may watch this later on uh, at the Living Earth Collaborative uh, uh, site in YouTube. Um, as William mentioned, and as you can see from the title of my talk, my plan today is to share with you some personal stories about botanical discovery which uh, is still very much an ongoing endeavor, uh, even though we're already two decades into the 21st century. Uh, as William mentioned, I'm a plant systematist by training, which means I study the diversity and evolution of flowering plants. And as he also mentioned, I did my PhD uh, there in St. Louis at uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden. I actually studied the Aureliaceae, the ivy and ginseng family in the Pacific Territory of New Caledonia for my PhD work. And then I joined the staff of the Missouri Botanical Garden just as I finished my PhD uh, to coordinate our program in Madagascar. A few years later, I was uh, asked to take on the coordination of our program in Madagascar, in Africa, uh, which I've been doing ever since. Uh, from my base here in France, I'm actually in France right now. I live here and I'm based at the, Natural Museum, the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, which is very convenient for studying plants in New Caledonia, 
and also in Madagascar because one of them is a French territory and the other one's a former French territory. So the herbarium here has very rich collections from both of those parts of the world. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate throughout my career, both as a PhD student at the Missouri Botanical Garden in Washu and uh, since joining the garden staff to work at an institution that has one of the largest and most impactful botanical research programs anywhere in the world. So first, a few comments or a little bit of background about plant diversity. Um, plants are a particularly important group of organisms. I'm sure you're all aware of that. They feed us and they feed all of the other animals that share this planet with us. They're also a, the source of an incredible array of important and useful products, uh, wood, medicines, but also the plants that we plant in our gardens or grow in our houses and that keep us happy and keep us alive in times when we're suffering from confinement with COVID and uh, even in better times, plants are still a very important part of what we do. Plant diversity is of course unevenly distributed on our, on our planet. Polar regions have very, very few plant species. Um, a fraction of the 2,750 species that occur in the state of Missouri, but the tropical regions of our planet are far more diverse so for example, the island of New Caledonia has about 14,000 plant species, that's our current estimate. And there are about 18,500 species in Ecuador, about as many as in the United States, but Ecuador only occupies an area about one and a half times the size of Missouri. So we've got a lot of plant species packed into smaller areas in many parts of the tropics. It's also true that our knowledge about plants, so, um, Botanists have had a long time to explore the flora in temperate areas, in particular Europe and North America, where uh, botanists were able essentially to study the flora in their own backyard or in the forests and woods near where they lived. The situation is very different in the tropics. First of all, we got started later exploring in the tropics. And then in addition to that, uh, we, there were, there were uh, very significant logistic uh, challenges to get to the tropics and to study the plants that, uh, that occur there. Um, so when I tell people what I do and explain uh, a, a large component of my research uh, activity involves going into the field and collecting plants and making new discoveries, many of them are surprised to find that we haven't already described all of the plants on our planet. Of course, that's very, very far from the truth. We're, we continue to make many discoveries today, and I'd like to share a few personal experiences or stories with you about uh, how we do that and how exciting it is. Let me begin with a little bit of background though. The main tool of a plant systematist like me is the herbarium specimen. So these are carefully prepared, dried and pressed plant samples, mounted on a sheet of herbarium paper and given a unique number. Each of them is associated with a label that contains information about where and when it was collected and some important characteristics of what the plant looked like, the size of the tree or various colors that might not be preserved in the specimen. And often, as you can see on the right here, specimens are also accompanied by photographs that are taken live in the field. So botanists have been documenting the world's flora by collecting specimens for centuries. And a modern herbarium, like the one at the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, is in fact basically a library of plant diversity from throughout the world. It's a slice through time over a couple centuries, but in, from, from an evolutionary perspective, that's an instant of time. It's a slice through time of the diversity of plants on our planet. So the herbarium at the Missouri Botanical Garden, there you can see it in the Bayer building, uh, located uh, just off the garden grounds, uh, has about 7 million specimens from throughout the world. And the herbarium at the Natural History Museum here in Paris, where I'm based, is about the same size as well. So most collections in an herbarium uh, are identified to a species that's well known and that's been named, but there's a significant portion of collections in any herbarium that do not have a name. Either they haven't been studied by a specialist and therefore have not been given an identification, but many of them also, especially in herbaria that are rich in tropical specimens, uh, represent species that haven't even been named or described. So a good specialist, a good botanist can't name them yet because they're, uh, they're species that have not yet been described. So over the course of the last four decades, I've been involved in dozens of expeditions, as uh, William mentioned, uh, throughout the world. And I've participated in 
all kinds of discoveries. Um, Elena and George, you'll recognize the photos that you took. Um, botanical discoveries come in several different flavors, and each of them is exciting and important in its own way. And so I'd like to share a couple examples with you so you can get an idea of the diversity of ways in which we actually make botanical discoveries. Okay, the first example I'd like to share comes from uh, Madagascar. Um, I've been involved in a project with my colleague George Schatz for a little over a decade. Uh, and we set out to understand and describe the diversity of the ebony genus in Madagascar, Diosporus. Uh, ebony species occur in essentially every ecosystem in Madagascar, uh, which is a large island located off the east coast of Africa. Uh, ebony's inhabit uh, uh, almost all kinds of climate substrates and they also represent an amazing diversity of vegetation and, more, and uh, floral and fruit morphologies. You can see just a few examples in the photos on, uh, on this slide right here. Diasporus fruits are very important sources of food for lemurs, birds, and other frugivorous animals. They're in many ways keystone species in many of the ecosystems where they occur. And um, not quite half the species uh, are large enough trees potentially to produce uh, valuable timber, uh, in particular ebony wood. You can see in the slide on the right, the very dark black core heartwood of a cut uh, ebony tree, which is uh, the source of ebony that's used for musical instruments and cabinetry and, uh, and other purposes, and which unfortunately is under significant pressure from illegal exploitation in Madagascar. Back in 1989, George was conducting a botanical inventory of the island of Nusimanga Bay in northeastern uh, Madagascar. It's a small island of about 520 hectares. And at the end of one day of collecting, he had fruiting material of 12 co-occurring species of diasporas. He laid them out on the sand and took the photograph that you see here, which has sort of served as the, the standard uh, or the emblem of the work that he and I have been doing over the last decade. It's a clear indication of the diversity of the fruit types that you see in diaspora, that you have so many species that, that were in fruit in the same place at the same time. Um, George had uh, herbarium specimens associated with each of these collections. And when he set out to try to identify them, he found it particularly difficult, in fact, almost impossible to identify a large portion of them, only a few of them could be named using the uh, scientific works that were available uh, at the time. So uh, um, there are 12 species that appear in this photograph here. And as you'll see a little bit later, uh, most of them were, were new to science. So um, over the course of the next 20 years from the time this photograph was taken, the botanical inventory work conducted in Madagascar by the Missouri Botanical Gardens team and, and people working for other institutions dramatically increased the number of collections available of ebonies and of all other plant groups in Madagascar and gave us a much better representation of the flora of the country. Um, so in 2009, George was on one of his many visits to Paris to work with me and a couple other colleagues. And we made the monumental decision, which at the time we said to each other, are we going to regret this? Well, it turns out we don't, we have nothing to regret at all. We began a careful examination of all of the material of diasporas that was available in the herbarium in Paris. And first we worked through the material that was named and identified based on Perrier Labatie's treatment of the family for the flora of Madagascar. And we basically boiled down the hundred or so species that he had named or he had recognized to about 80 and place the other ones in synonymy. But as we took a look at uh, the remaining material, which was about half of the specimens, uh, they didn't fit in any of these species. They, many of them had flowers and fruits. There was great material, but it didn't belong to any of these species. And in fact, after about a week or 10 days of, uh, uh, of looking through the material, we came up with an initial estimate uh, of about 130 new species that remain to be described. In other words, less than half of the total number of species had been described, which explains why George was only able to put names on some of the 12 species that he collected that day in 1989. So this is an example, this is a, a very good example of one of the kinds of discovery that botanists make. 
Carefully studying specimens that are deposited in an herbarium can lead to the realization that uh, a group that you're studying contains new species. In other words, botanists discover new species in the herbarium using specimens that have been collected years, decades, or even in some cases, centuries earlier. So that's type one of discovery. Over the last 11 years, George and I have continued to work on Malagasy and we've actually made a lot of progress. We've recently published a couple papers, you can see the titles here, in which we've described uh, 13 new species, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have five other papers now that are in various stages of publication with another 55 species being described, but that still leaves 80 more and uh, we'll be working on those over the course of the coming years, which will bring us up to about 250 named and described species of Ebenezer in Madagascar which will make it the largest genus of woody plants in the island and a remarkable example of a massive radiation of an ecologically important group uh, in, uh, in the island nation of Madagascar. Uh, in addition to our work on ebony, botanists uh, from Missouri Botanical Garden and other institutions have discovered hundreds of other new species in Madagascar in the same way, while conducting careful taxonomic studies of various groups usually involving herbarium studies, sometimes supplemented or complemented by doing field work on their own, as George and I have done uh, in Madagascar. And in most groups that we've studied, it turns out uh, that we often double the number of species, sometimes less, but sometimes more, as in the case of Ebony's here, where we've significantly, we've increased by almost a factor of two and a half. So there's hundreds of new species to be described and discovered in Madagascar, above and beyond the ones we're doing on Ebony's here. Okay, let's travel now to another part of the world. Let's go to New Caledonia in the Southwest Pacific. As I mentioned earlier, that's where I did my doctoral research. This is a French territory uh, located off the uh, coast of uh, Queensland, Australia and to the west of Fiji. It's a biodiversity hotspot in particular, is remarkably rich for a little territory the size of, uh, uh, of uh, New Caledonia, which is only a little bit larger than the state of Maryland and yet it packs about 3,750 plant species, three quarters of which are found only in New Caledonia on this little island. So I've had the pleasure of uh, being involved in a number of botanical inventory projects and also staying involved in taxonomic research with several colleagues since completing my PhD and I get back to New Caledonia regularly uh, to participate in expeditions. So one of the most botanically rich parts of the country is in the far northeast. It's the Mont Panier Massif. It has New Caledonia's highest mountain, Mont Panier, at 1,628 meters. But it's actually a chain with a series of summits. And it's the wettest part of the country. It has uh, uh, these high mountains. The trade winds come in off of the, off of the east and dump massive amounts of rain, especially on the northeast facing slope here. So it's an area that's known to have a high level of botanical diversity. There's lots of species that are endemic to one or more mountains, but it turns out that there's a couple summits within the Peña Massif that were essentially unknown botanically, including Mount Inyambi, uh, which is the second summit from the, uh, from the north. So we organized a botanical expedition there in May, 2002. Uh, my colleague Gordon McPherson and I, with several colleagues, spent about 10 days on the mountain and slowly worked our way up the mountain from our base camp. Each day we would go a little farther from the base camp. And by about the seventh day or eighth day, we reached the summit of the mountain. And on our way walking back down from the summit, uh, about 20 minutes after we left the summit, we passed under a tree, which uh, we had missed on the way up. We'd walked right underneath it, but had, didn't see it on the way up. Fortunately, we saw it on the way down. Um, it had flowers and fruits on it. We collected some specimens, and as we looked at them, we realized we were dealing with an interesting plant. We, neither of us had seen it before. We didn't recognize it. We weren't even sure what plant family it belonged to, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So I took a few minutes to carefully photograph and prepare specimens, uh, and as I did that, Gordon walked a little farther down the trail, and after about 10 minutes or so, he called up and, uh, or he shouted back up the hill and said that he'd found another tree, and this time he'd found a tree with male flowers. It turns out that this plant is dioecious. It has separate male and female individuals, which is characteristic of uh, less than 10% of uh, plant species. Uh, but this one is dioecious. And so we were fortunate enough to get flowers and fruits, uh, flowers and fruits of the female and flowers of the, of the male individual. 
So when we got back to camp that evening, we laid the specimens out. We looked at them very carefully. We had pressed them in the field, but we hadn't yet begun drying them. And we charted out a little table trying to figure out what family it belonged to. And we were not able to figure it out. In fact, it turns out that it wasn't until some time later that we were able to, to determine what plant family this belonged to. So we knew we had an interesting plant. Uh, we collected some DNA material in, preserved in silica gel. And since we couldn't figure out what family it was, uh, we teamed up with uh, Patrick Sweeney and Jason Bradford, who were graduate students at the garden at the time. They uh, did uh, some DNA extraction and were able to determine that the plant we had collected belonged to the family Cunoniaceae. And its characteristics uh, were atypical of uh, any known genus in the family Cunoniaceae. So at that point, we, re we realized that we actually had collected the new genus of Cunoniaceae. We were fortunate enough to get full material of it, and we described this new species. So here is an example of discovery that was actually made in the field. We collected the plant. We didn't know what it was when we got it, but we had enough experience in New Caledonia to know that it was interesting. And then the second phase of discovery came with the results of the, of the molecular analyses, determining that it was a member of Cunoniaceae, and then describing it as a new genus within that plant family. So that was a particularly exciting and gratifying adventure because Gordon and I were able to be involved in each of the steps from the collection in the field all the way through to the publication of the papers that you see here. Okay, uh, let's go back to Madagascar now. Um, we, the, those of us who are associated with the garden have been involved in botanical work there since the, the mid 1980s. We've been to lots of parts of the country, including many areas that had never been explored before. But there was an area in the very, very deep southeastern part of Madagascar, the Vuimena mountain range, which runs parallel to the east coast and inland, separated by a valley from Anduahela National Park. Now, Anduahela has been fairly well explored. George went there many times at the, in the, when he was living in, uh, in Madagascar, and lots of botanists have been there over the years. But as we began to compile information and map our mm -hmm. collections in Madagascar, we realized uh, that there were uh, that there were no uh, um, collections that had uh, come from the Vuimena area, and so from from Vuimena we realized we were we were looking at a, a an area of potential interest, and we also learned from some people who had been uh, going up the coast that there were areas of intact forest coming down to very very low elevation, which is exceptional in uh, eastern Madagascar. People occupy the East Coast. People clear forests to grow rice to feed themselves. And it's very rare to find an area with forest that comes down as low as this, 100 meters elevation. So we organized an expedition to the Bemangidi area, which is the part of the Vuimena Mountains where the forest comes down lowest. And we knew we were in for something interesting uh, when we got there, but I don't think any of us had any idea how rich the flora would be in, until we actually got boots on the ground and started collecting. So as William mentioned, I study the family Aureliaceae and within the first three days on site, we collected the first material ever of these four new species of Aureliaceae, which have since been collected multiple times in the Vuimena Mountains, but they are all restricted to this area. So they only occur in this one mountain range in far southeastern Madagascar. We have them all now in flower and fruit. They're each very distinctive within the two genera, Neocusonia and Polysias, to which they belong. Um, some of them are ecological specialists. The one on the right, Polysias manoni, grows only on uh, exposed granite slabs uh, with forest growing all around them. They grow in the crevices of the, of the granite slabs. So four new species in a few days in the plant group that I study, uh, and not just new to science, but the first collections ever. So there were no historical collections of any of these four species in the herbaria, even though people have been collecting plants in Madagascar for a couple centuries. Uh, the morning of the first day, we also collected this amazing plant in the aster family. If you look at the photo on the right, you can see mm -hmm. the little florets that are quite similar to uh, the little flowers that you see at the middle, in the middle, for example, of a sunflower. So this is a member of the aster family. We knew what family it belonged to, but we had no idea what the plant was when we collected it. I, I think these inflorescences look, look a little bit like red coral. They kind of remind me of some coral that you see. So here's the page of my field book from that day, and I've circled the information that I recorded about this species of, uh, of Asteraceae. Uh, 
Um, half an hour, 40 minutes later, we collected this plant. And on the right, you see the field book, which is two pages later in my field book, where I've marked number 6657 as a species of what we thought at the time was Sabona in the Sapotaceae. These flowers are an inch or an inch and a half long. They're quite spectacular. Uh, they're, they're really very beautiful and it was a striking plant. And we knew again, it was something interesting when we collected it, but we didn't know how interesting it was until these plants were pressed and duplicate specimens were distributed to colleagues working in other herbaria. Uh, well, one in St. Louis and one in the Botanical Garden in Geneva. It turns out that on this morning, we had collected for the first time ever two new genera, not just new species, but two new genera that had never been seen and never been collected before. So this shows that the area of Benangidi was indeed rich, much richer than we ever expected. I think it's probably safe to say that uh, very few people have had, or very few botanical teams have had the pleasure and the honor of being able to collect two new genera on an expedition. But uh, we did a knockout punch on one day, February 7, 2006, which, were, which was a, an, a particularly exciting day of discovery. Okay, I've got enough time left to talk about uh, another set of discoveries. So let's pick up stakes now and move off to the neotropics. Um, most of my career has been involved in New Caledonia and Madagascar, but uh, I've, in my studies with several colleagues uh, looking at the family of Raviaceae, we've actually studied them worldwide. We've looked at the evolutionary history of the group. We've understood that one of the genera, in fact, the biggest genus, Schaeflera, which occurs or used to occur uh, in all, essentially all of the tropical parts of the world. Well, our phylogenetic studies showed that Schaeflera actually was not a natural genus. There were five completely different clades five completely different groups of things being called Schefflera in different parts of the world. So uh, as luck or misfortune would have it, the true Schefflera's, the group that are associated with the generic name, happen to be the smallest of the clade. It's just eight species that occur in islands of the Southwest Pacific, including here you see Schefflera um, pseudocandelabrum from New Caledonia. So, the group in Asia and the group in Pacific, in the Pacific, uh, another group in the Pacific were separated off as the genera Heptapleurum and Plyrandra. In Madagascar, we recognize Neocusonia. I showed you a photo earlier of a Neocusonia and there's also a, the genus Astropanax. And that left the big complex neotropical clade of Schefflera. So Greg and I obtained the National Science Foundation grant about four years ago to try to explore and untangle and make sense of this remarkably complex group in the neotropics where there's a fair number of collections, but very few of those collections were named and people were actually uh, had, had, very, had real challenges trying to put names on these plants. So uh, all of the 202 currently recognized neotropical species had to be taken out of Schefflera and moved somewhere else. Based on detailed phylogenetic studies, we now recognize five distinct genera that can be told, told apart from each other morphologically. They're phylogenetically distinct. They also have a certain amount of geographic structuring to them as well. Um, the largest of those genera is Ciodaphilum, which William mentioned earlier in the picture that was behind him when he was doing the introductory remarks as a new species of Ciodaphilum. Uh, we've now transferred the 132 published species from Schefflera to Ciodaphilum, that's done. So the nomenclatural part is cleaned up. Although people who are used to calling these plants Schefflera are gonna be grumbling for a while. They'll get over it, sorry. Um, but we also are faced with about 200 or more new species that, named, that remain to be described. That's an estimate that's been floating around for 20 or 25 years. Our unfortunately recently departed colleague, David Froden, had examined these over the course of his entire career and had estimated that there were probably 200 new species in the neotropics. It turns out that's probably an underestimate. So over the last four years, we've conducted herbarium and field work in uh, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, and Peru, and we will be going to Bolivia sometime soon. The COVID situation enables us. So uh, most of the species in Ciodaphilum are ecogeographically narrow. They occur in one or a few mountain ranges in one part of a country, or sometimes they'll straddle a particular border. 
So they have uh, uh, very small geographic ranges, but they almost always co-occur with other species. So there's very often two or three or six or eight species of former Schaeffleras, now mostly Ciodaphilum, that co-occur in a, in a given area. So the species that you see here is a new species that we collected in uh, Northern Peru. Uh, we're going to call it Ciodaphilum hamiligulatum because the ligule, which is part of the leaf base, is in the form of a hook. You can see that on the right-hand side here. So that's how we came up with the, uh, with the species uh, uh, epithet. So let me briefly walk you through um, a, a series of discoveries that we made in January 2019. Um, in January 2018, 19, and 20, as part of our NSF grant, Greg Plunkett and I, in collaboration with David Neal, uh, who uh, is, used to work for the Missouri Botanical Garden and is now a professor at the University in Puyo in Ecuador, organized a practical three-week course for beginning doctoral students, some master's students also, from North American institutions and also from South American institutions, to spend time with us in the field learning how tropical systematists actually go about doing field work, go about documenting and discovering and describing a diverse group of plants like uh, Aureliaceae and, and Ciodaphilum in particular. So during these field courses, we spend a little bit of time uh, going through and providing lectures and background information for the students, but mostly we go into the field. Um, so in, in January of 2019, so a year and a half ago, we started out by going to the Rio Zunyac Reserve, which is only about uh, 25 kilometers from Puyo, very near where David works. It's located uh, on the slopes leading up to Yanganates National Park. It's an area that uh, David had visited before. He had established a couple plots there. It's an area that's known to be uh, botanically very interesting and very rich. Well, it turns out while we were there, we collected material of five new species of Ciodaphilum in the six days that we were there. Only one of which, Ciodaphilum balsaviae, which you see in the top center there, top left, had been collected before. All of the rest of them were completely new to science and had never been collected prior to our visit to uh, Rio Zunyac. Now, we had a few days earlier, we'd been at another site, um, a little bit lower elevation, uh, about uh, 20 kilometers to the, uh, to the east of Rio Zunyac. None of these species occurred there. That site had about eight species of Ciodaphilum, uh, some of which were new and were locally endemic. So in the course of traveling just a short distance, there was a, a, a remarkable species turnover. So as part of the January 2019 trip, we then traveled down to the San Francisco Reserve, which is located near Loja, um, about 300 kilometers south of, uh, Rio, Zun uh, of Rio Zunyac, still on the eastern slope of the Andes and at a similar elevation. We, when we were at San Francisco, we collected uh, material of three more new species of Ciodaphilum, completely different from the ones we had seen before, different from each other. The two here that you see at the bottom and on the right-hand side, Ciodaphilum pedersenii and Ciodaphilum sancti francisci, superficially look similar to each other. And uh, in fact, we were tricked ourselves, our first collection of Ciodaphilum pedersenii, we thought it was material of uh, sancti francisci, which we had already collected three or four times. But the leaves were completely different, not so much in shape, but they were whiter underneath. And more importantly, when we pressed them, they just they just shattered. They were, I won't say like glass, but they were really, really sensitive and just broke up into little pieces. It was really hard to make a specimen. We said, boy, this was not, not like uh, the other ones we had we'd, we'd collected. It must have been a plant growing on some substrate or something. Well, we figured out a little bit later on that it was a different species. And then when we looked more carefully, we saw that there's a, a large number of morphological characters that distinguish them from each other. We then traveled uh, about 55 kilometers away to the Tapichalaca Reserve, again on the eastern slope, uh, due south of Loja, uh, actually fairly close to the border with Peru. And at that site, similar elevation, we collected four more new species of Ciudad. So each of these events represents discovery. In the case of Ciudafilum, which we have been studying for a number of years, as we made these collections, as we found these plants, we would, we would cut the tree, 
or a branch off the tree, we would look at the plant, we'd take out our hand lenses, we'd think very carefully, does this look like anything we know from this area? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Sometimes we'd have to wait until the evening before we could get back to our computers. But oftentimes, if you're collecting in a group that you know well, you realize either at the moment you collect it or within, the, the, within hours or a day after you've collected something that it represents a new species, that it's something that's either never been collected before or that someone got once or twice and made a fragmentary collection, whereas we, may, we were able to make full collections with leaves and carefully preserved inflorescences accompanied with photos and, uh, and silica gel for molecular phylogenetic studies. So a lot of discovery is made on the spot in a sense. But many discoveries are made after the fact. Somebody who is out doing general collecting, as William has done in, uh, in the area uh, around Cusco in southern Peru, where he's from, uh, the photograph that he showed uh, over, behind him is actually Siodafon uh, a plant that my colleague Greg Plunkett and I have collected at Waikatcha Reserve. Um, when William collected that plant, I dare say that you, well, you might have known that it was a, a new species because Robin Foster had perhaps spotted that before. But lots of times we make a collection, it goes into the herbarium, it may get studied a year later or 10 years later or 30 years later before somebody takes our collection and turns it into a discovery of the, of the first kind I described, the aha moment you can have in an herbarium when you make a collection. I have to say that both kinds of discovery are very gratifying in different ways. Usually the work that's done in the herbarium is more synthetic. You've laid out lots of specimens. You're awash in characters. You're thinking carefully about a group. You've usually got a dissecting microscope nearby and you're actually thinking about whether a particular specimen does or does not belong to a species that's already got a name. And it's, it's kind of like um, if, you're, if you're behind a fogged up window and the, the, and the steam slowly burns off, things become more and more clear. You start to get a better and better understanding. And when it's over, when you've really got a handle on the, on the group, uh, it, it becomes crystal clear in almost all cases. Sometimes it is, doesn't work out that way, but usually it does. Usually you end up getting a really good understanding of the differences between the species. Plants are full of characters. Certainly these Ciodaphilum that we've been studying there, as you can see, they're big structurally complex plants. The picture on the right, that's Greg Plunkett's leg. You can see that that inflorescence is as big as the lower half of his leg and the leaves are, including the petioles, as long as his arm. Pressing them is a, is a pain. Lots of people don't like to press them and so specimens are often fragmentary. But it's very gratifying when you're able to make collections, especially collections that represent discoveries and you're able to be on the, the front line of documenting the amazing diversity that occurs in the tropical parts of our, of our planet. And we're not just document, documenting these things, but each of the new species that we describe, whether it's Ebony's that George and I are describing in Madagascar or Ciodaphilum that we're describing from the, from the neotropics, they're all accompanied with an IUCN red list assessment. So we assess the conservation status of the species and we're able to indicate which species are of special concern for conservation which managers of parks and reserves, uh, people who run botanical gardens and other people who are involved in actually making conservation happen are then able to take that into consideration. And hopefully uh, many or maybe even all of these species can be protected through time because many of them are threatened. When you have plant species that occur that have very narrow ranges, especially in areas where forest clearing is taking place, and where, uh, where people are clearing land to feed themselves or to harvest the timber or for whatever reason, uh, there's a lot of pressure and the populations, the native populations of many of these species are under pressure. And I've unfortunately seen far too many instances in Madagascar where a population that I collected 20 or 30 years ago doesn't exist anymore because the forest has been completely removed. So there are some stories of discovery there's still a whole lot more out there to be discovered. And I hope that this has given you an idea uh, and a little bit of insight into how we as tropical plant systematists go about documenting, describing, and discovering the incredible diversity that's out there in the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Peter. That was a really impressive talk. Thank you so much and fantastic photographs and documentation. You're a truly a botanist, we can say that. <laughs> so this is more I'm wondering, um, what it feels to travel around the world and discover so much? Well, there's a couple parts to it. Uh, first of all, it's very exciting when you go to a new part of the world. As I said, the neotropics were new to me, essentially new to me four years ago when I started working on this project. I'd been uh, on, a, on an OTS course to Costa Rica back when I was a graduate student, but really the neotropics were completely new for me. So in that case, there was also a language uh, element to it and a cultural element to it, because when we go to the countries that we work in, we don't just go into the forest and collect plants. You get there by going through cities and towns. You always work with local people, which is one of the most uh, pleasurable and gratifying parts of the, uh, parts of the process. Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, there are, it's interesting that there are similarities and differences between different parts of the world. And maybe this is a, a little example I can, I can, uh, can, can share with you. The, the structure of a tropical forest, mm -hmm. many tropical forests, when you're standing in it, is, can be very similar. You can go to a place in New Caledonia, close your eyes, teleport yourself to Madagascar, open your eyes, and then close your eyes and go to some place in Ecuador. And when you open your eyes, the forest will look a lot alike. It won't be identical, but the, 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 the feel, the humidity, the, 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 the way the, the, the vegetation occurs will be very similar. And yet between those three places, there will be zero plant species in common, none. Not a single plant species will be found in, in, in common between those areas. So there's, there's this sense of wonder when you travel around the world and when you get a chance, and as I have, to be able to go to, to, to many places to, uh, to appreciate that, the, that there's diversity at all kinds of levels. And, uh, and getting a snapshot of the world's diversity is, is exciting and something that I like to try to share with others. Thank you, Pete. Your talk was incredible and definitely took us around the world. Um, we've got a couple questions from people that are watching live stream. So I'm gonna um, ask you one from John Birmingham Jr. who asks, to what extent do ebony species have morphs that are able to breed with one another? Are the new species distinguishable genetically? So um, we've seen very few examples of hybridization. So crossing between uh, distinct species of ebony uh, in the ones we've looked at in Madagascar. We have got a few uh, cases where we think there may be hybridization, but for the most part, the species seem to be morphologically distinct from each other, which suggests, although we don't have any scientific evidence yet, it suggests that there is very little gene exchange between the species. Um, in terms of genetic distinction from each other, so we, we've only just begun doing using DNA sequence data to explore uh, the ebonies of Madagascar. But uh, a graduate student, um, um, Alex uh, Minan, who worked at the Missouri Botanical Garden and University of Missouri St. Louis, and is still doing a postdoc at the Missouri Botanical Garden, looked at the ebonies from the Mascarene Islands. So this is Mauritius and Reunion, which are located uh, several hundred kilometers to the east of Madagascar. The, the ebony flora there is much more modest, but there's a nice little diversification there. And uh, he did a genetic study which demonstrated that in, in, uh, in the Mascarene Islands, there are genetic distinctions between the species. But in that case, there appear to be some clear examples of hybridization, uh, of gene exchange between species. But we don't have any evidence of that in, uh, in Madagascar. In New Caledonia, George and I also looked at the ebonies in New Caledonia. I didn't mention that earlier, but uh, we've got a few examples of possible hybridization there. But for the most part, 98% of the specimens we see clearly belong to one or another species. Thank you. So a lot of questions are coming. Uh, here's a good one. How about scientists discover a new species? What's the process? How do you name that species? So this, the discovery, as I say, can, co can come when you discover it in the field or you discover it in the herbarium. Uh, if you're a plant taxonomist like myself and my colleagues, uh, when you are working on a plant group, you first, of course, learn those species that already have names. And any plant that has a, a unique set of morphological characters, 
and that grows in a, and or that grows in a distinct environmental uh, situation that doesn't fit with any of those plants that already have names represents what we call a new species. Now, when we say new, that means new to science. The species, of course, has existed for thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. It isn't that it's new in an evolutionary sense, it's new to science. And so one of the pleasures we have being plant taxonomists is that we get to name these species. We get to decide what to call them. So we can name them after a place. The plant behind William is, uh, is Theodaphilum waikachensi, named after the Waikicha Reserve. Um, we can name plants after people. So we can name plants after colleagues or after the person who first collected the species or after somebody who's been made an important contribution to science or to conservation. We can also name them after a morphological character. So something that has a particularly large leaf might have its species name grandifolia to mean that it has a large leaf and to distinguish it from other members of the same genus that have smaller leaves. But we get to pick the name and that's uh, part of the fun of taxonomy is trying to come up with a name. The name should be informative in one way or another. It, informative in that it gives you a chance to honor someone. So if I publish a name and we, we I'm, going to, I, I'm going to publish a species diasporus and name it after George, so it'll be diasporus Schatzii, and I will add a little paragraph and say this species is named in honor of my friend and colleague George Schatz, and then I will say something about George uh, so that that's recorded in time and that the species is named in his honor. Thank you. Um, this question kind of segues into that one nicely, I think. So this person asked, for the uh, Bermangidia expedition, had you talked to locals from the region about the flora and uh, the indigenous populations? Do they have different names for the different trees that you ended up discovering for science? You know? <laughs> right. So we, we, always, you, uh, we always do field work with local people. And locals in a country usually means two different things. It means scientists, botanists from the country in which we're, we're working, so our local colleagues, these will be people from the National Herbarium or uh, people who are professors or sometimes students in the universities. And then when you go to a field site, you, will, you need people to help you carry your equipment and supplies into the forest, but you also need people who know how to get around the forest, people who know the forest personally. So you'll always talk with the local village chief. Of course, it depends on what country you're in, the, the ceremony and the procedure of finding the right person and hiring the appropriate person or persons is different in each country. And that's part of the fun of it is figuring that out. Uh, the customs are very different from one part of the world to uh, one part of the world to another, but you always go into the field with people who have local knowledge of the forest. Now, they sometimes have knowledge, and it's the most important part for us, knowledge of how to get around in the forest. They know where the river valleys are. They know if there are little trails. They know how to get up onto that ridge over there. Um, they're, they're familiar with the logistics of getting around in their forest. And in case where there's any dangers to be aware of, they're, all, they're also aware of that. Um, we, we don't use much ethnobotanical information. At the Missouri Botanical Garden, I have colleagues who are specifically focused on studying plant uses, uh, and that's called, that's the field called ethnobotany. Uh, we don't do much ethnobotany in the kind of basic exploration that I do. If people tell us about a plant use, we'll sometimes record it. We won't always record it because sometimes that's sensitive information, and if you're conducting an ethnobotanical study, best practice says that you first must explain very carefully to the people you're working with what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you'll use the information, and how you will not use the information. It's called prior informed consent. And since our basic botanical inventory work does not have an ethnobotanical focus, we don't, we don't need to be involved in prior informed consent about cultural or traditional uses of plants, but we also don't query people about it. In some ways, it's a lost opportunity, uh, but many of these sites, people come back, ethnobotanists come back and will study local uses of the plants in the areas where we work. Thank you. Uh, this question is in Spanish, so I will read it in Spanish and then in English, so our viewers can speak Spanish countries so they can understand too. So the question says, ¿Qué géneros son prioritarios para estudiar en los bosques montanos neotropicales? This is a question from Amel Monteagudo, I think he's from Peru. And so in English will be, what are the priority genera to study in the neotropical mountain forest? Oh boy. <laughs> 
I am not an expert on the neotropical flora uh, as a whole. I actually am not the best person to answer that question. There are lots of people who, who, uh, who can tell you what important genera are to study. I will tell you that there are lots of Ceodaphyllum to study. My colleague, Greg Plunkett and I, one of the goals of our NSF project is to build a network of people in the Andean countries who when we retire and when we've done our, this first round of laying the groundwork, we want to pass that on to people uh, in local countries. So there's lots of Ceodaphyllums to be studied and also species in some of the other genera that are, uh, of Arabiaceae that occur there. But there are other very important and understudied genera in the neotropics for sure. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that question and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm not in a position to do it, but I'm sure if you uh, were, I'm sure that there's a, a way to send me an email if you want, I'd be happy to forward an email to colleagues at the Missouri Botanical Garden. I know plenty of people who would be happy to suggest five or 10 genera that are uh, in need of study. Uh, there are plenty of them, that's for sure. Thanks, Pete. We have another question here. Lots coming in, this is great. Um, how has COVID affected the team and projects in Madagascar and how do you think it will affect conservation activities throughout the country in the long term? So uh, that's, a, that's a very important and timely question, of course, around the world. Uh, in the case of the Missouri Botanical Gardens program in Madagascar, so travel within the country has been, uh, has been completely forbidden for the last three months or so. Uh, so our staff at, the, uh, at our main office in Tananarive has been uh, spending their time looking at specimens. Fortunately, there's lots of specimens to look at. Um, they've been doing a lot of data analysis. We've been doing a lot of writing up of projects. They've been, there's been plenty to keep them busy. In some ways, uh, I mean, we've missed a field season, so that's unfortunate. But in some ways, it's also, there's been a blessing uh, associated with that. It's given or imposed on our staff the time necessary to take care of a lot of things that, that need to be done and that were not necessarily high priorities for us. Now, I hope it doesn't go on for a whole lot longer because we're, it's now Malagasy winter. The spring and the good field season begins in October, especially November, December. And I'm really hoping that our teams will be able to get back into the field pretty soon, even if on a limited basis. In terms of our conservation sites, um, it, it, thus far, the pressure on, our, on, the, on the 13 conservation sites that the Missouri Botanical Garden operates in collaboration with local communities, the pressure is not increased a lot at most of the sites. It has increased at some of the sites, but we tried to be proactive. When COVID was first starting to come on the radar screen, radar screen, even though there were no cases yet known in Madagascar, we knew it was going to get there and we knew it was going to eventually uh, have an impact. So we started trying to stay one or two steps ahead of the curve and to implement some emergency or some, some, uh, some advanced measures. A number of donor organizations also saw the writing on the wall and generously offered, we didn't even have to ask, generously offered to provide modest but important amounts of emergency funding to deal with specific issues associated with the, with the COVID. So for the time being, we're about four months into it in Madagascar. Uh, I would say that we, our program has not really suffered but it's kind of like holding your breath. We can do it for a little while longer. I don't think we'd be comfortable doing it a whole lot longer. And you know, it's very, there's no way to predict how much longer this is gonna go on. I, I'm sure that a few months from now, we will be looking at and thinking about the next things we need to do. It's a challenge, definitely. Uh, Everywhere around the world for all of us. <laughs> yes. Are you serving uh, any biotic attrition in Madagascar, like for example, species uh, extinction? Well, extinction is a difficult thing. Uh, proving that something has gone extinct uh, and, and classifying as, as it as extinct on the IUCN red list actually requires going out and carefully doing a survey to try to prove, I guess is the way to say it, that the species no longer occurs at all of the places where it was previously known. So we know of a few species in Madagascar that apparently have truly gone extinct. We also know that um, in the first 15 or 20 years of our program, so this is up until about uh, um, a little bit after 2000, we had a series of students who took on projects, mostly groups that George and I or other people were studying. And we would look at a group and we'd say, oh boy, this species hasn't been seen or collected by botanists since the 1950s. We wonder if it still exists. I bet it's not there anymore especially if it didn't come from a park or reserve. 
You know, they went out and in most cases they were able to refind it. Often they refound it in, in, refound it in a little patch of forest that was highly threatened. And I bet if we went back today, some of those things that we found then might be gone today. So there's undoubtedly some extinction going on in Madagascar. It's also true that when you look at a map of a species based on the collections that we've made, that of course only represents a teeny, for, teeny portion of the true distribution of that species. We haven't, it's rare that a plant has been collected in all of the places where it really grows. Sometimes that happens, but that's usually the exception. So very often uh, when, when we lose one subpopulation, maybe the only known subpopulation, that doesn't necessarily mean that the species has gone extinct. Thanks. This person says, thank you for your talk. Um, at what stage do you use molecular tools at the beginning to confirm new identities or not necessarily in the context of floras with little or no molecular work, for example, India? Right. So molecular data will not tell you unequivocally whether something is or is not a new species. At least in, in botany, we very rarely use molecular data to do that, with a couple exceptions. If you have a number of populations that you say, this represents a species. And then you do a molecular study and you actually see that some of those populations are on one evolutionary branch and other ones are on a completely different evolutionary branch. That means that the thing you were calling a species actually isn't a species, it was two separate species. So that will cause you to rethink and redefine your species based on molecular evidence. But when we make a new collection, like the photographs that you saw in the last slides that I was, that I was uh, showing here, we, we do collect DNA. We are doing molecular analyses. They're ongoing right now. But the molecular analyses are, are the goal is not to, to tell us whether these represent new species. We already know that. And I'll say something about that in a moment. The molecular analyses will enable us to ask questions like, um, do all of the species that have these large heads, these groups of fruits that look like a, a tennis ball to get, uh, uh, or a golf ball, are, are they, did all of those species with that, with that kind of structure evolve once, or did that kind of structure evolve multiple times? The answer is it evolved multiple times. In fact, uh, Car Carlos Rodriguez Vaz, who did his PhD with my colleague Greg Funk at the New York Botanical Garden, he focused specifically on this globose capitate group and showed that, they, that that character evolved multiple times. Now, uh, how do we tell the species are different from each other? It's almost always based on morphology. And in, a, in an interesting way, I'm a 21st century uh, systematist with my training in the last part of the 20th century, but a large part of the kind of work that I do, do is not really all that different from what Linnaeus was doing 250 years ago. Yes, we have better tools. We now have anatomy. We now can, can look at wood structure. We can look at pollen. We have better microscopes than, than he had back then. We know more about how plants have evolved, so we just have more collective knowledge that we bring to the table. But really, it's based on looking at morphology and comparing differences. And in most groups, you'll find that species, even closely related species, differ from each other in multiple characters at the same time. And once you learn to read the characters, once you learn to sort of get the feel of a particular group of plants, species lock into place pretty quickly. And when we go back and do our molecular studies, occasionally we find out that we got something wrong and I've been involved in a few of those, but that's the very rare exception. Almost always the molecular results are consistent with our interpretation. So we'll have Let's say we have seven different molecular samples from plants that look alike and that we say belong to the same species. We then do a phylogeny. Those seven things will come out grouped together as you would expect if they were a single species from a common ancestor. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Can you estimate the undescribed species in Aralyaceae in the tropics? Ooh, uh, of, of Aralyaceae in the neotropic in the tropics. Yes. Well, the bulk of them are going to be in, in, in the former genera of Schefflera. So there's probably 200 plus species in Asia of Heptaplurum. And as I said earlier, there's probably 250 or maybe even 300 species of Ceodaphylum. There will be, there's probably 10 or 15 species of the genus Cephalopanax, which I haven't mentioned, but that's a new genus that we're describing from the Neotropics. Uh, and then there's probably a hundred or, or so 
150 species uh, in other groups, many of which I've already got manuscripts uh, uh, prepared to, to describe those species. So I've got about 70 new species to describe from, uh, no, 60 new species from New Caledonia and another 90 or so from Madagascar in other genera, not in, not in the, the ones that I've been uh, showing you in this talk. Um, so I guess that adds up to what? We're, gonna, we're looking at probably uh, 650 to 700 new species of Aureliaceae that remain to be described that I'm aware of, and there's undoubtedly more out there that have just never been collected. Oh, yeah, there is uh, a couple more questions. Uh, maybe we can ask this one too. Um, it's, uh, do you know like the evolutionary history of Schifflera in the North Tropics? It seems that Schifflera are the, the star of, of this talk. So do you know the evolutionary history of Schifflera in the North Tropics and where happened this species radiation? Right. So the neotropical, what we call Scheffleroids, because they're not Scheffleras anymore, but the neotropical Scheffleroids, the species that were previously uh, placed in Schefflera, are part of a larger clade or a larger evolutionary group within Aureliaceae that's mostly Asian. So we call it the Asian palmate group. They have palmate leaves. Almost all of the genera in this group, there's about uh, um, eight or 10 genera in Asia and two genera in the Asian palmate group in the Neotropics. Actually, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, Dendropanax and, uh, uh, actually three, Dendropanax, Oreopanax, and the Scheffleroids are all part of this Asian clade. It appears that the Scheffleroids reached uh, the Americas probably at a time when there was connectivity across the Bering Land, Strait, uh, land Bridge. So they probably migrated uh, at a time when, um, uh, when tropical and subtropical forests were situated much farther north than they are today. And there was a, probably a direct migration into North America and then migration south and massive diversification in Central and South America. I mean, the group has just completely exploded and gone bananas. I mean, there's also a lot of species in Central America that I, that I haven't mentioned at all. Um, it may well be that Oreopanax, which is an, uh, a, a large genus in the Neotropics, its sister genus is one species on Taiwan, one species endemic to Taiwan. And yet they look very similar to each other. They're clearly sister to each other. They're not the same genus. In this case, it looks like the common ancestor to, uh, to, um, to Sinopanax and Oreopanax migrated from Taiwan, or it might have been in continental China, across the Pacific to, uh, to South America. So that was a transoceanic dispersal event rather than uh, migration across the Bering Land Bridge. Those are, those are hypotheses based on um, uh, molecular work that's also been uh, uh, um, mapped. At, we've got a few fossils of Aureliaceae, and so we've tracked them through time, and we know a little bit about the fossil history of some of these genera. But a lot of this is still speculative. And you know, in, in some groups, the fossil record is very good and we can have a really good idea where species occurred in the past. Unfortunately, Aureliaceae do not have a great fossil record. And that's a, a bit of a handicap for our ability to retrace the historical biogeography of, of the family we study. Great, thank you so much. And thanks again for this really fantastic talk. Um, it's almost time. Uh, but I wanna, I don't wanna finish this uh, without reading this last uh, message again from Abel. It says, "Congratulations for this great presentation and greetings from Cusco, Peru." So the other side of the world are watching this talk too. Thank fantastic. you so much. It, it was really fantastic and exciting to hear all these new discoveries and how we still need to learn about nature and still a lot to discover in the nature. Thank fantastic. you. So it's been my pleasure sharing it with everyone. Uh, I hope you. Uh, appreciate the, the tropics and will uh, do your part to help support conservation and scientific endeavors in the tropics. And I also want to thank those of you at the uh, Living Earth Collaborative for making this uh, series uh, possible. And I look forward to the next series whenever you decide to start this up again. And to everybody, stay tuned with a new LC seminar series in the fall.